one. My guest today is Cam Hawkins, and today we are going to talk about the legendary team Leonidas and the 300. And I, what is it about this legend that makes it so fascinating? Well, I've long had an interest in Greek military history in general, um, and more precisely in interactions between the Greek world and the Persian Empire. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's an interest that was cultivated both when I was an undergraduate student uh, and in graduate school, thanks largely to the influence of a bunch of professors who specialized in this kind of area. Uh, so interest in Sparta kind of grows out of that. Um, and I've published a little bit on the Spartan army, but more broadly, Greek military history is something that I hope to return to in a published form in the near future. Um, I, I think it, for those of us who don't not really familiar with Greek history, it was ancient Greece a country or was it divided in smaller states? <laughs> uh, a complicated question. Um, the short answer is no, there was not a country of Greece per se in the way that we tend to think of countries today. Uh, what you had was a fairly large area in the Aegean and in the wider Mediterranean world that had come to be inhabited by people who around 500 BCE identified themselves as Greeks, right? And their zone of influence was uh, a little bit different than the modern nation of Greece today. So we find people who identified themselves as Greeks living in, for example, the Western coast of what is now Turkey. There were a number of important settlements there. We find them living along the shoreline of the Black Sea. We find them living in North Africa, in Sicily, in Southern Italy, and as far west as southern France. And so modern Marseille is basically founded over top of an old Greek settlement, the ancient Greek city of Massilia. Altogether, there were, I would say, probably about a thousand separate political communities in this, in this area. The most common sort was what we call the polis. We usually translate that as city-state. Right. It was a small community built around an urban center that also had an outlying territory. Some of them had populations of a few thousand people. Yeah. The larger ones like Athens or Sparta had populations maybe in the neighborhood of 200,000 people. Uh, but very few of these were united politically in any meaningful sense uh, at the time of the Persian invasion. Of course, I tend to make the history of Sparta its own episode, but just briefly, where, where do Spartans come from? When did they start calling themselves Sparta? When did they, when did they start calling themselves Sparta? That's a... <laughs> so Sparta sits in the southern part of Greece. Um, if you look at a map of Greece, you've got a main peninsula and then a smaller peninsula, which extends to the southwest. That smaller peninsula to the southwest is uh, an area we call the Peloponnese. Sparta was situated in the southern part of the Peloponnese in a big river valley, uh, the valley of the Eurotas River. Um, it emerged probably sometime in the early Iron Age. Uh, so we're talking sometime post 1000 BC. There were other settlements in the area uh, that existed before Sparta. So Sparta was a relative newcomer, but it quickly established itself as the dominant power in the Southern part of the Peloponnese. And by about 500 BC, the Spartan polity or the Spartan state controlled directly about two fifths of the territory within the Peloponnese. So it was a large and powerful state by comparison with a lot of its neighbors. As I've already mentioned, it had a total population probably in the neighborhood of 200,000 people. That includes freeborn men, women, and children, as well as the dependent or servile population, which outnumbered the free population by quite a bit. Uh, but with a population of 200,000 people, it was an order of a magnitude larger than a lot of its other neighbors. And did they sacrifice those children that deemed unfit to, to be grown, to grow up? There is a story in one of our sources, Plutarch, that says exactly this. Um, so the story is that when a child is born, uh, the Spartans, rather than the father himself, 
examine the child to decide whether or not the child is worth rearing. And if the answer is no, then they would expose the child basically in the wilderness in order to die. Um, I will say that we have to be a little bit careful simply because Plutarch is a relatively late source. He's writing during the late first, early second centuries AD. Uh, and he's drawing on a lot of material that reaches back into antiquity from his perspective, but he uses sources that come from a variety of different periods. So he uses some sources from the fifth and fourth centuries, the classical period, but he also uses a lot of sources from the Hellenistic period and later. And it's not always clear which sources produce which bits of information that we find in- Do we have any other evidence from this just, or just this source? The main, the main, the main source for that particular story is in fact Plutarch. Hmm. So it's quite brutal. Perhaps, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how, of course, I'm trying to ask, that's always in these cases, how, I, what did, did you think about this? Have you seen the Zack Snyder movie? And what is it? What did you think of it? The movie 300? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I do not like the movie 300 um, for a lot of reasons, uh, one of which is simply the fact that in my view, it fails on a lot of levels of <laughs> cinema, right? I don't think it's a very interesting movie um, to watch. Uh, and that's before we get into all of the ways in which mm. the movie plays with and, and perhaps distorts what we know of Sparta and the Persian Wars from other sources. So how did the training of a Spartan soldier go? I mean, I think feel like we need to talk a little bit about the Spartan soldier and the soldier's life in Sparta. So how does right. the training of soldier go? How do you get recruited? Was it a mandatory thing or did you volunteer? Right. So this is a complicated question. And my answer is also going to be kind of complicated. And I think uh, the place to start... <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I hope your listeners do too, because this is going to get really complicated. Um, I think the best place to start is by talking a little bit about the social structure of the Spartan state, right? One of the things that I think strikes people when they start reading the ancient sources is that the Spartans, when they interact with the larger Greek world, didn't typically call themselves the Spartans. They called themselves the Lacedaemonians. Um, that's formally the name of the Spartan state. It consisted of the Spartans themselves, that is people from the city of Sparta, but the freeborn population also included people that we call the perioikoi. Uh, these are people who lived in outlying settlements who were also freeborn. They were citizens of the Lacedaemonian state, but they were not Spartans. So there's a, there's a distinction there. It's rather as if people in Norway drew a firm and important distinction between people living in Oslo and people living in the rest of the country. Yeah. Um, strictly speaking, only people who were Spartans, who could trace their ancestry to Spartan families, could participate fully in the political institutions of the Lacedaemonian state as a whole, right? The Perioikoi could not, yeah. and obviously the dependent population, the Helots, could not as well. Now, I remember watching a documentary a few days ago, and they said that they had two kings, is that correct? That is true. Um, and we'll touch on that in a second uh, before I get too distracted. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> right. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, so you've got this distinction between the Spartans and the Perioikoi. There was also another distinction within the Spartans themselves. And that was a distinction between people we usually call the homoioi, a word that meant those who are alike, those who are similar, and uh, another group of Spartans who are sometimes called the inferiors or the hupomeones. And the distinction there was usually one of wealth. In order to count as a full grade member of the homoioi, you had to be wealthy enough to uh, essentially support yourself without working, to participate in the city's political and military institutions, and to make contributions to the communal military messes in which full Spartan citizens participated. So when we're talking about Spartan training, what we're really talking about is the sort of training in which the homoioi in particular participated. Right? So it's a system of training that was technically available to only a small minority of the population as a whole, and even only a small minority of the freeborn population at Sparta. So that's the sort of preliminary, right? Yeah. Um, 
As to what happened, that can be a bit challenging to sort out. And again, our fundamental problem here is one of sources. There are two principal sources that talk a little bit about the Spartan system. One is a, a, a piece of literature written by Xenophon in the early fourth century BC. And the other is Plutarch, who again is writing centuries later. Both of them talk about how Spartan boys and young men were brought up, but there are certain differences between their presentation. And that's probably because a lot of Plutarch's data refers to later periods of Spartan history. Uh, for that reason, I think that Xenophon is our best guide. And what he basically describes is a system in which Spartan boys and young men were divided into three groups based on age. Uh, so there's the first group, the young children, these are boys between the age of about seven and puberty. There's a middle group. Um, those are adolescents between puberty and probably about 20. And then there's a third group, young men between 20 and 30. And at Sparta, what was distinctive about this whole system is that uh, boys and young men in all three of these groups were basically um, raised collectively by the polis. Right. They were organized into groups and spent a lot of their time together in these various age groups. And they took place in a number, took part rather in a number of activities that seem to have been designed to inculcate a few main attributes. Right. They were taught obedience right, to obey the authorities at Sparta. That seems to have been a big component, according to Xenophon. Um, they were taught basically to endure hardship, if you will. Right, so we get stories about uh, the rations that boys ate, and those rations were intentionally kept lower than was optimal uh, by the authorities in order to encourage boys to forage or to steal additional food. Well, and we, they and were, I remember, yeah, I remember they mentioned something like this in the documentary that would be punished for getting caught, not for stealing. Yes. Right, this is, the, this is the story, right? Not only did you have to supplement your diet mm. by foraging or stealing additional food, you had to do it um, in a way that conformed to certain rules. And above all, I mean, you had to do it in a way uh, that didn't get you caught. So the idea there seems to have been to make people resourceful and clever, right? And another and thing the other... I mentioned, and yeah, you're probably gonna to touch on this, so sorry for interrupting you there, but they were whipped as well by the older boys in, in the club? Yes, um, the disciplinary system was interesting to say the least. Uh, Xenophon has a few things to say about this, but basically there were um, older men um, in the 20 to 30 year age group, it seems, who were in charge of the younger boys under the general supervision of a civic magistrate, the paidonomos, right, the guy who raised children. And we're told that they were given whips that they could use to inflict physical punishment on boys when they deemed it necessary to do so. For example, when people were caught stealing. I'm sure people would um, take advantage of that. Well, here's, here's an aspect of Spartan society that we don't really understand very well. Um, you know, to what extent was taking a beating a regular feature of Spartan life? Like a Catholic, so it wasn't like a Catholic priest in today's society. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope not, right? Yeah. Um, but, but um, you know, one of the aspects that Xenophon kind of focuses on is this this bit of Spartan training, the ability to suffer physical pain, um, whether it's pain meted out by discipline, um, being whipped for doing something, or pain uh, which results from getting into a fight in a competition. There's a lot of emphasis in Xenophon and later in Plutarch too on competition between boys in different age groups, some of which was physical, some of which took the form of boxing and stuff like that. So where, where does Leonidas come from? Where does he come into this picture? Was he born a king or was he just a little boy raised enough to become a general? Right. So was he even real? You. Was he even real? Did well, it <laughs> actually exist? Or is it just a myth again? So there are a bunch of questions here that are worth unpacking. And maybe one we should start with is this whole question about whether or not Leonidas was a real person or not. Um, my suspicion is yes, he was a real person. Uh, there's no particular reason to doubt this. Um, our earliest stories about Leonidas, our earliest surviving stories about Leonidas and the whole battle at Thermopylae come from Herodotus, 
He's a Greek historian who was active during, let's say the 440s and 430s BCE. So he's writing about 40 to 50 years after the battle at Thermopylae. His job was pretty difficult because he had to go and gather a whole bunch of conflicting oral traditions told by people in a whole bunch of different Greek city-states right. and, and try to shape those stories into a coherent overall picture. Um, and one can argue about whether or not he got things right. Um, part of the problem here is the entire Persian Wars had become heavily politicized during yeah. his day. And all these members of individual Greek states wanted to stress their own contribution and minimize the contribution of other people. That said, he's writing for an audience that included some people who had lived through the Persian Wars, who would have been maybe 70 years old, or he was writing for an audience that often included the sons of people who had lived through the Persian Wars. He also claims to have seen various bits of real tangible evidence from the Persian War period. So when it comes to Thermopylae and Leonidas, what he claims to have seen are a bunch of monuments that were set up at Thermopylae in the years immediately after the battle. Um, these included epitaphs honoring the Peloponnesians, the Spartans, a couple of other individuals. It also included a statue of Leonidas himself, um, allegedly. So, I mean, there's no real reason to doubt that he was a real person. So if we grant that, right, yeah. then we can talk a little bit about who he was. Uh, and who he was, it seems, just judging from Herodotus, was a member of one of the two so-called royal families at Sparta. This gets us into some complicated aspects of Spartan politics. Uh, but basically, at Sparta, you had a political structure in which there was a council of about 30 people, most of whom were over the age of 60, with the exception of the two kings. They deliberated on most of the policy in Sparta. Policies then had to be voted on by the larger assembly of Spartan citizens. The kings themselves did not uh, exercise a whole lot of formal political power. They were wasn't primarily... More like, was more like the monarchy today, in a sense? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So you can think of Sparta as a constitutional monarchy if you want. Hmm. right? So the kings had some real uh, ceremonial powers. Uh, they were important figures in Spartan religion. Hmm. They controlled a couple of key Spartan So it was not an absolute monarchy. No, it was not an absolute monarchy at all, right? So their formal powers were really in the religious sphere and in the military sphere, where they served as basically the commanders in chief, if you will, of Spartan forces when Spartan forces were in the field. Um, as I mentioned, there were two families that produced kings. So at any given moment in Sparta, there were two hereditary kings who served as chief priests and chief army officials. Leonidas came from what is often thought of as the senior of these two families, the Agiads. He uh, was not thought somebody who was likely to become king when he was first born. And the reason for that is he already had uh, two older brothers. The oldest was his half brother, Cleomenes, and he also had an older full brother, a guy named Doryaeus, as well as a younger brother, Cleombrotus. His eldest half-brother, Cleomenes, initially became the king of the Agiad branch, probably around 520 or so. And in theory, what should have happened is that Cleomenes would have had a son of his own, and that son would have succeeded Cleomenes as the Agiad king. That's not what ended up happening. Uh, Cleomenes did not have a son. He had at least one daughter, um, Gorgo, uh, but daughters could not succeed to the position of, of king in the Spartan system. So because Cleomenes didn't have a son, succession automatically went to his brothers. And now, the by the time- was the next in line. <laughs> he was the next in line by the time Cleomenes died. Uh, and that's the case because Doryaeus, Leonidas's other older brother had died at some point in Sicily uh, before the death of Cleomenes. Um, so Leonidas basically became king sometime after 490 uh, in a situation in which he had not originally expected to become king. Uh, and that's an interesting observation because it means that he possibly did go through the Spartan training program. Yeah. 
Kings normally did not, actually. It's a, a weird aspect of Spartan culture. But since Leonidas was not in the immediate line yeah. of succession when he was a boy, he probably actually did go through the training program. And I want, I want to ask how, how did he rise in the rank of the Spartan army? Did he, was it only the rich, like the Romans, could become generals, or did, did anyone could become gen, general in the Spartan army? That's a very complicated question. Um, without a doubt, the senior people in the Spartan military system were the two kings. They outranked everybody else, yeah. and they did so largely by virtue of their birth, right? But below them, there was a complicated hierarchy of officers, or at least there was in the later fifth and during the fourth centuries. Mm -hmm. One of the limitations of the evidence is that it's really hard for us to figure out what the Spartan army looked like yeah. during the Persian War period. But if we if we think a little bit about the later Spartan army, we can distinguish several ranks of officers. Uh, the Spartan army was organized into a number of large units, probably of about 600 soldiers, although that's disputed as are pretty much all details about the Spartan yeah. army. Um, so there was an officer in charge of each of so these there was units. So there was 300. Yes, um, they're not part of the regular structure, interestingly enough. So we'll come back to them. Um, but the regular structure did have you know, regular units starting from these large units of 600 or so and working down through a number of subunits to the lower yeah. level units, which had about 40 people in it. So you ended up with at least four tiers of officers. How people ended up with those positions is hard to say. I'm sure that birth had something to do with it, right? There were certain Spartans who were from more prestigious families, yeah. in spite of all these uh, these claims that the Spartan homoioi were equals, uh, but also personal merit and success and accomplishment possibly had something to do with it as well. Hmm. Now, if we wanna talk about the 300 for a yeah. second, um, we know from Herodotus and from later sources that there was a group at Sparta called the Hippes. That's a word that means the horsemen. We often translate it as the knights, right? They numbered 300. In spite of the fact that they were called the horsemen, they fought on foot. Right? So it's an honorific title um, rather than a reflection of how they actually worked in combat. Um, according to Xenophon, they were selected from people in the 20 to 30 year old age category. Uh, it was an honor to be selected, and part of being selected involved proving that you deserved to be among the 300 <laughs> by defending your position in the 300 against other Spartans. Was it more um, like a series of gladiator games, or was it just fighting and death, it was, or was it just like good little sport? What Xenophon says is that other Spartans would regularly challenge members of the 300, um, you know, question their right to be in the group and get into fights with them. Beyond that, the details are a little bit murky, but the sense he conveys is that people who were part of the 300 could expect to get into boxing matches a yeah. lot <laughs> with people who were who were envious of their position. Mm. Right. So now, how does, um, yeah, no, carry on. I was just going to say it's, it's sometimes thought that this group of knights, the 300 knights, are the 300 who accompanied Leonidas to Thermopylae, uh, and that's um, entirely yeah. possible. Uh, but what's weird is Herodotus doesn't actually say that, even though he is aware that the 300 knights existed as an institution. Yeah. So we there's a little bit assume. of uncertainty. Yes, right. But how did Leonidas come to, to be general of this group? So the answer to that question turns on the politics of the years 481 and 480 and the reactions of various Greek states to news that Xerxes and the Persians were launching a campaign against mainland Greece. Hmm. Um, essentially, the very short version of this story is that when it became obvious that Xerxes intended to march on Greece, a small number of Greek states began to discuss an alliance with which they could collectively defend their interests. The Spartans emerged as the leaders of this alliance largely because it seems they already had a fairly important network of allies within Southern Greece, within the Peloponnese. Um, on top of that, of course, they were also one of the largest Greek states and probably the most military dominant state in the Greek world. Yeah. So they were the natural hegemones or leaders of this emerging alliance. 
What that meant is that to the extent that league forces were going to take the field, Spartan officers would be in command of those forces. In 480, the allies deliberated about how best to resist Xerxes and the Persians. And given their expectation that they would be heavily outnumbered, both on land and at sea, a lot of those deliberations focused on identifying places that could serve as bottlenecks, right? Where they, a smaller number of soldiers or ships could effectively block the advance of large Did they, did they intend to go for guerrilla warfare or? No, guerrilla warfare isn't quite what they had in mind. What they really had in mind was stopping up choke points. Um, so for example, they initially seemed to have hoped to send forces to the Tempe River Gorge. Uh, that's a, a river gorge that separates Macedonia in the north from Thessaly in the south. And they thought that a force of about 10,000 soldiers, heavily armed soldiers plus support personnel probably, could effectively block up that pass. Um, it turns out they were wrong. Uh, what Herodotus says is that they got to Tempe and discovered that there were too many ways to get around that position. Um, so they abandoned that idea. And their next thought was to defend the pass at Thermopylae, which again uh, offers uh, a fairly narrow and confined space in which a small group could defend against a larger army. It's also convenient because a small fleet could potentially keep a larger naval force out of the straits that lead from the Gulf of Magnesia into the bay around Thermopylae itself. So the Greek allies decide to defend this position. And again, uh, because the Spartans are kind of in charge, uh, it was only natural that Spartan officers would be in command of the forces. Uh, so what we find is a Spartan officer named Eurybiades in command of the fleet and one of the two Spartan kings, in this case, Leonidas, leading uh, the land forces, as was the prerogative of the Spartan kings. So, that's a, and, well, what about the actual battle itself? When did the 300 meet Persia, and how does it unfold? Right, um, so, here we have to contend once again with the nature of our sources. Right. Herodotus, our earliest source, is writing about 40 years later, maybe. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, he already inherited a number of conflicting traditions about the battle that he had to try to sort out. We have some other traditions that survive in later sources as well. Uh, the main surviving alternative is a story that pops up in a late author called Diodorus. Uh, he's writing around the time of Augustus, the Emperor Augustus, so much yeah. later. Although the story he tells can arguably be traced back to the early fourth century uh, and perhaps derives from a, a Greek historian of the late classical period named Ephorus. Um, there's a little bit of tension here that we can maybe explore as we go along. Yeah. Uh, but I'll say for the, for the moment that most people prefer the version that we find in Herodotus. And what Herodotus tells us is that the Greek allies descent, decided to send a combined land army and naval expedition to defend the pass at Thermopylae and the straits nearby off the northern coast of the island of Euboea at a place called Artemision. Um, so what they do is they put together a combined allied fleet of about 271 warships, according to Herodotus, and they put together a land army anchored around 300 Spartan soldiers under Leonidas's command. There were more people that went on this expedition, right? And Herodotus kind of gives you the preliminary breakdown. And according to his numbers, uh, the overall force consisted of about 3,000 heavily armed Greek soldiers from the Peloponnese, including the 300 Spartans, as well as a couple of thousand from central Greece, um, chiefly from Thebes and Thespiae, two cities in Boeotia. Uh, but also from areas a little bit further north around Thermopylae itself. So altogether, Leonidas and his 300 Spartans anchored an army of about six to 7,000 heavily armed Greek soldiers who were probably complemented by more lightly armed troops, some of whom were slaves there in personal attendance upon their masters. And so one of the things that becomes really clear is that the Spartans had a bunch of helots with them, 
helots were members of the uh, unfree population of the Lacedaemonian or Spartan state. Um, Herodotus yeah. claims that a bunch of them actually get killed in the fighting, so it's possible that they played some role in the battle, although that's difficult to define. And this seems to be what differs Sparta from next the Roman army, because if a slave, I really talked about this in the Roman army episode, where if a slave came, you could be killed, and the person who brought the slave into the army could get killed for it. So that right. seems to differ the Spartan army from the Roman army. Yes, um, I should say that there are some caveats here. And the main one is that we don't precisely know what role helots played hmm. at, at the battle at Thermopylae. Um, broadly speaking, it was probably normal for a well-off Greek warrior at Sparta or elsewhere to take along at least one slave on campaign, hmm. a slave who could do things like help carry the armor, yeah. right? Um, help the warrior put the armor on before battle. Um, and they could, in theory, play a peripheral role in the fighting as light skirmishers, uh, light troops. And it seems that the Spartans may have been willing to let the helots play that role more frequently than was the case in other Greek armies. But there are a lot of unknowns there that we have to be aware of. Did they really fight like Zack Snyder portrait and just shirtless and just wearing toe, not, not even toe, just, just red, red and pen of pants, you know, underpants in a way? Almost certainly not, right? Um, here too, there are problems though, uh, and those problems really concern the evolution of Greek warfare over time. Um, by Herodotus's day, a lot of Greek armies were anchored around uh, a soldier that the Greeks called the hoplite. Right? It's a word that really means the guy who had equipment for war. And what that meant in Herodotus's day was actually fairly specific. It was somebody who was armed primarily with a long thrusting spear, uh, probably about eight feet in length, and who carried a broad round shield. You wore the shield by passing your forearm through a central armband yeah. and by gripping a secondary grip on the outer rim. In addition to that, most hoplites usually wore some kind of body armor. Uh, the old fashioned style by Herodotus's day was a bronze breastplate and backplate along with a helmet and greaves. Yeah. Uh, a more contemporary style in Herodotus's day was uh, a composite form of armor made primarily out of linen that had been layers of linen that had been glued together, sometimes reinforced with letter or metal plates, perhaps a light helmet but the greaves seem to have gone away, but that shield still remained central to hoplite armor. Was armor expensive in ancient Sparta or did they have, did they have to pay for it themselves or was it equipped once you were for you? Generally speaking, armor was fairly expensive. And broadly speaking in the Greek world as a whole, in order to fight as a hoplite, you had to be relatively wealthy, right? Because in most Greek states, you provided your own equipment Hmm. and your own, your own armor, your own weapons. So when we're talking about hoplite armies, what we're really talking about are armies of people who belong, broadly speaking, to the upper middle class and above, the upper middle class through yeah. the aristocrats. At Sparta during the early fifth century, that is probably true as well. But um, at Sparta during the early fifth century, there was a fairly large group of homoioi the group of homoioi in the early fifth century, people who qualified as full Spartan citizens who were wealthy enough to do so, these people existed largely because of the way the Spartan state developed in the sixth century. Um, it was a, a state that had benefited a lot from conquest of neighboring Greek states. And in particular, the Spartans had conquered a region to the west of Sparta itself, a region called Messenia where a number of communities had been overwhelmed and their inhabitants had been reduced to some kind of serfdom or slavery. Mm -hmm. And the Spartans seem to have divided up the lands of Messenia amongst themselves, as well as the newly conquered helots of Messenia. And as a result, around about 500 BCE, there was a large group of Spartan citizens at Sparta itself who were wealthy enough um, to equip themselves as hoplites and to participate in the developing civic institutions. 
Mm. Uh, but you know, this is a long answer to your short question. No worries. Is, pardon, spite I love long answers. I love long answers. Well, I'm, so. I'm glad you do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about uh, again. I don't know well. about like you said. I don't know about my listeners, but I love and again the long story. But uh, yeah, about the battles as we were talking about earlier. And I think I got distracted. We did the distracted off topic, but the battle itself was it really alone, or did they have? How did it come out to be a, the legendary three hundred? Did they fight alongside other three hundred legions, or did they right. fight solo? So, so, as I mentioned, the three hundred Spartans with Leonidas were the core element of a larger force of somewhere between six and 7,000 heavily armed Greek hoplites, um, plus perhaps some more lightly armed troops, including a bunch of helots. They marched north to Thermopylae while the, the complementary fleet took up a station at Artemision to prevent the Persian fleet from sailing in to the Gulf and from landing troops near Thermopylae itself. Leonidas, his 300 Spartans, and the rest of this army of six to 7,000 people took up a position at Thermopylae. Thermopylae is an important artery of communication between central and southern Greece. It's not the only artery of communication. There's another main road that also uh, linked central and southern Greece. But the road through Thermopylae is important because it was the only coastal route. So if an invading force, like the force of Xerxes, wanted to maintain communication between its land forces and its fleet, it basically needed to control the road that ran through the Thermopylae Pass. So that made it uh, a perfect spot for a force like the, the Greek army commanded by Leonidas to try to block the southward advance of Xerxes and his soldiers. Yeah. The nice thing about Thermopylae is that the ground there is pretty confined. Um, what you had essentially was a pass defined by a very narrow entrance point on the west and a very narrow exit point on the east. Um, Herodotus says that it was uh, the width of basically a cart track at the two entry points. In the middle, things broaden out a little bit, but there's a, an area that we usually call the middle gate where the road ascends a relatively steep hill or did in antiquity anyway, and where an, an old defensive wall had been built long before Xerxes' invasion of Greece. I want to ask, have, you been, have you been to the location yourself where the supposed battle took place? Sadly, no. I've been to a lot of places in Greece, but I haven't made it to Thermopylae yet. Um, so my knowledge of the topography depends on published yeah. accounts. Oh, yeah. um, I should state, just because this might become relevant, that if you do go to Thermopylae these days, the topography looks a lot different than it did in antiquity. And that's because there's been a lot of silt deposit as a result of a couple of main rivers that flow uh, into the Gulf there. So the shoreline has extended out quite a bit. But also Thermopylae was famous in antiquity and continues to be famous for some mineral springs, mineral hot springs. And those have deposited a bunch of minerals in the highlands as well. So the whole topography has changed a lot. And it can be kind of difficult to draw connections between what we see on the ground now and what Herodotus describes. Sort of like going to the World War I battlefield where the trench is supposed to be. Right. Um, so it can be hard to uh, tie the account to specific topographical yeah. features. That said, what a lot of people uh, have concluded is that the Greeks, that is Leonidas's 300 Spartans and the rest of this 7,000 person coalition, mostly took up position in the middle part of the pass where this old defensive wall had been constructed. And Herodotus tells us that they basically repaired that wall uh, in the expectation that they could integrate it some way into their defense. The bulk of Leonidas's forces were stationed near or behind that wall. Part of them, however, 1,000 people from Phocis, an area just to the south of Thermopylae, were situated on the mountain above because the Greeks had learned that there were a couple of passes that came around the mountain from the other side that could potentially be used by an invading force to turn the pass. Right? So the plan seems to have revolved around most of Leonidas and his forces defending the pass at Thermopylae itself and a smaller group uh, attempting to make sure that the Persians could not flank that position. 
Now that's the uh, situation as it existed for the first few days after Xerxes actually arrived in the area. What Herodotus claims is that Xerxes showed up um, in Malus, um, the region just to the north of Thermopylae itself, and his army sort of bunked down there, um, partly to wait for the fleet to make contact and to base itself nearby, but also partly because we're told by Herodotus, Xerxes kind of expected the Greeks who were defending Thermopylae to think twice about their plan <laughs> and to retreat once they saw how large his army actually was. Um, so there was a period of four to five days where not much happened at Thermopylae. In the end, Xerxes' expectation did not come true. Right? The Greeks decided to hold their position. And so on the morning of the fifth day after Xerxes arrived, he ordered his forces to advance on Thermopylae itself. So we end up with a first day of fighting, spearheaded mostly by Iranian troops. Um, we have to remember that the Persian Empire is an empire based principally in what is now Iran. Mm. Uh, troops who had to uh, undertake a fairly difficult challenge. Basically, they had to advance uphill and they had to attack a fortified position, right? Because the Greeks had repaired this wall and were incorporating it some way into their tactical plans. Um, Herodotus is unfortunately very vague about the character of the actual fighting, so we don't know precisely how the Greeks drew up their plans, but it's pretty clear that the wall was an important element of that plan. Given the wall and given the narrowness of the terrain in general, um, the Greeks were able, even with their smaller forces, to basically beat back several waves of attacks from the Persians on this first day. Uh, what seems to have happened is that Greek contingents took turns. Um, they sort of rotated their position a little bit. Uh, so different contingents at different moments would be stationed behind the wall, while others would, if necessary, uh, kind of come out from the wall to beat back the leading edge of Persian attacks. Um, and as I said, that went on for much of the first day. Uh, Herodotus claims that the Greeks suffered a few casualties of their own, but killed many more Iranians and Persians as they repeatedly repelled Persian attacks on their position. Now, I would, was the Greek army more superior than the Persians, even though there were fewer? Did they have more experience? Or did they were they just better or were they equally? You love these complicated questions. Oh, yeah. You uh, know it. <laughs> and I love talking about these complicated questions, uh, but they all have complicated answers. Bring it on. <laughs> um, so for the most part, Greek armies in this period were not professional armies, right? They were armies of just citizens, wealthy citizens who, when it was necessary, got together their armor and their weapons and marched off to fight. The Spartans they, they didn't made, have this burning desire to die for the city state, to die for the country in honor. I, that, that may actually be true, that they did have this sense of, of honor right, and commitment. Mm. Um, if they did, it's because a lot of them, as I said, were relatively wealthy. They were people from high ranking families, many of them in their own local communities. And they lived in a culture that was very competitive and very agonistic. Right? And the way that you demonstrated your worth in Greek society, especially if you were from a higher ranking family, yeah. was by competing in certain ways. You could compete in athletic competitions. Mm. You could compete in politics by uh, getting elected to office. And you could also compete by demonstrating your courage on the battlefield. Right? So for a lot of these Greek warriors, it was important to demonstrate their personal bravery. Um, and it was important to demonstrate that personal bravery in relation to their city state, because part of what you're doing is demonstrating to your fellow citizens that you deserve the honor and status you possessed back home in your in your native communities. And um, how long time does this battle take place? You mentioned five days of preparation and then a few days of war. So how long time does does the battle last span? And last? The fighting at Thermopylae, the fighting at Thermopylae lasted three days. Um, you know, it was complicated again by the fact that the Persians were essentially assaulting a fortified position <laughs> that could be readily defended by a, a smaller army. 
uh, this is probably not a complicated question, but would it help the Greek if they were, because they lost obviously, but would it help if they were a unified country like the Persian, Persian Empire, or would it have not have done much at all? That, <laughs> another one of these complicated questions. I warned uh, you. It's a, <laughs> it's, it's a question, actually, it's interesting because it, it raises a tension between the way Herodotus describes what's going on um, and the way modern historians tend to, tend to think about what happened, right? Um, Herodotus tells the story of Thermopylae in a much larger work that really talks about um, the rise of the Persian Empire from its origins in 550 through to the defeat at uh, the Battle of Plataea in 479. Right? So he situates his discussion of the Battle in Thermopylae in a much larger narrative context. And part of what he's interested in doing is explaining how and why the Persian Empire emerged and also how and why the Greeks managed to repel this massive attack in 480, 479 on the Greek world. And in order to do that, he comes up with a bunch of complicated uh, theories, if you will, about what drives history. If you're playing a drinking game, you can take a drink every time it's say complicated. <laughs> I know, I know, right? I mean, hopefully your, your listeners can put up with this. Oh yeah. Um, but the very short version of the story is that for Herodotus, there was a real tension between uh, autocracy and more deliberative forms of government. And he has this idea that people who lived under an autocracy, under a king who gave orders, were not necessarily the best warriors. They could be in certain circumstances, right? To a certain extent, they wanted to demonstrate to their king <laughs> that they were worthy of honors that the king might like to extend to them. But in other contexts- You're talking about the Persians uh, now, right? Not the Spartans. Yeah, the, well, in general, this is a general yeah. rule he makes mm. about, about systems in which there is an absolute monarch, yeah. in which the, the Spartans do not count, right? Mm. Um, but his idea seems to be that like a king could inspire his troops to a certain degree by offering rewards and things like this. Uh, but by and large, in a system that's governed by somebody with absolute power, individuals were not necessarily heavily invested <laughs> in fighting for themselves and therefore would not always be the most reliable soldiers. Mm -hmm. By contrast, Herodotus makes the argument that in a system where people deliberated about politics, made collective decisions, and therefore had a personal stake, uh, they would be much more likely to devote themselves to the cause, if you will, and would, as a consequence, fight a little bit better. Right? That's yeah. Herodotus's argument, and it may or may not reflect reality, but that's certainly what he thought. Um, so if your question is, would the Greeks have fought better if they were politically united? Yeah. Herodotus might actually say no, <laughs> right? That um, part of what made the Greeks special was the fact that they all deliberated about policy mm -hmm. in their own communities and collectively as part of this bigger alliance, and that that was a strength, not a weakness. Right. And I mean, personally, I would say, and I think a lot of historians would also make the argument that the main problem um, at Thermopylae was not disunity amongst the Greeks um, so much as it was they didn't send enough forces to simultaneously hold Thermopylae itself and to prevent the Persians from turning the position. Although I guess you could argue if you wanted to that the, the size of the force, the fact that it was a little bit smaller than one might have hoped may reflect tensions among the Greek command and maybe some, some reluctance on the part of Southern Greek states to fully commit to fighting too far North. And again, you mentioned that there is, uh, they, there wasn't just the 300 and the right. units, right? But so why did they stand out from the other 300 units that fight? So part, part of this is just the mythology of Thermopylae as it develops in the period post the Persian Wars. Um, but part of it also turns on what Leonidas and the Spartans mm. actually did at Thermopylae. Right? I've mentioned that this is a three-day battle during yeah. which the Greeks are primarily trying to defend this wall at the pass at Thermopylae itself. Day one and day two, according to Herodotus, were pretty similar. The Persians would launch a wave of attacks against the Greek position and the yeah. Greek contingents defending Thermopylae would protect the wall and sort of take turns coming out to fight just beyond the wall if it was necessary to push back a Persian attack. Mm. So the first two days is very much a collective effort on the part of the Greeks who are defending the pass, 
you asked a little bit earlier if the Greeks were superior, right, to the mm. Persians. Yeah. Um, I've sort of alluded to Herodotus's take was that there were certain aspects of Greek culture that made them fight better in certain circumstances than the Persians. Uh, but in other respects, it's kind of a difficult question to answer because believe it or not, there are a lot of arguments about how it was the Greeks actually fought during the Persian war period. Uh, we know from later, later periods that in Herodotus's own day, hoplites, when they fought a battle, would form up in formations that later come to be called the phalanx. Um, these are fairly deep formations, six, eight, 12 people deep, several hundred people wide, and they fought basically as a coherent block. Do you um, have more sources on how they fought in the Peloponnesian War or the yes, crazy yes. kind of similar warfare to the Peloponnesian War? This is the big question, um, and there are multiple schools of thought on this. There's sort of a classical or orthodox school of thought which says that the, the phalanx that characterizes the Peloponnesian War period was developed early in Greek history, and so that the Greeks at Thermopylae would have been people who, used, who were used to fighting in a phalanx. Uh, but a lot of other historians argue that actually the phalanx was continuing to develop right through this period, <laughs> right? And that we don't get the classical phalanx we know from the Peloponnesian War until sometime after uh, the Persian Wars themselves are over. Uh, so for that reason alone, it's sort of difficult to sort out whether or not uh, one side or another had a tactical edge. So we can't will, compare. We can't compare the Peloponnesian War to this. I forget what is the name. For the myth, I forget the name of the battle. But it, we can't compare the two battles together. It can be. It can be challenging depending on whether or not you believe <laughs> that mm. the phalanx pre-exists the Persian Wars yeah. or not. And opinions remain mixed on this. And this is something that historians are probably going to continue to argue about for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, I will stress that, you know, again, the Persians were trying to do something very, very difficult. They were trying to attack a fortified position where the ground did not allow them to take advantage of their numbers, to take advantage of cavalry tactics, which they prided themselves on, um, to take advantage of their, their skill as archers. And instead, basically, they had to launch these repeated assaults up a hill <laughs> against that fortified position, against defenders who had the advantage of terrain. Um, so the fact that the fighting on the first couple of days did not go uh, in favor of the Persians doesn't say much about whether or not the Persians were worse than the Greeks when it came to fighting. It simply reflects the challenges of the position and the challenges of the task yeah. that Xerxes was imposing on his soldiers. Um, you know, what we can say is that both sides fought pretty hard. And although uh, Herodotus- Did the Persian have a certain respect for the, for the Greek? I mean, the, the sense Herodotus conveys is that the Persians were surprised by the fact that they were unable to dislodge the Greeks from their position. Hmm. Um, and in particular, he focuses on one particular group of Persians, the so-called immortals, who were uh, I think the core contingent of Xerxes's army, um, they were, as far as we can tell anyway, ethnic Persians. They were probably Persians from relatively high ranking families and they formed kind of the semi-professional core of Xerxes forces. And what we're told is that on the first day, they were one of the groups who launched one of these wave attacks against the Greeks. And like other soldiers who were sent in wave attacks against the Greeks, they were beaten back even though Xerxes uh, and the commander of the immortals, Hydarnes, uh, had full confidence that they would make short work of the Greek defenders. Yeah. Um, anyway, so two days were like this, right? Two days, the Greeks managed to hold off uh, Persian yeah. attacks. Now, if you're the Persians, of course, you realize very early on that the Greeks are not going to be dislodged easy, easily. Uh, and you realize very early on that the terrain is difficult, right? And that you're yeah. asking your soldiers to do something very challenging. So if you are, are you aware commander, after day two or day three that they're going to lose this, did they realize that we lost, that we don't have stand a chance against Persia? Right. Well, this is uh, ultimately what happens, right? The evening of day two, um, the Persians finally discover that they can get troops around behind the Greek position. Basically, Thermopylae is flanked on one side by a big mountain. Uh, in modern Greek, it's called Kalidromo. Uh, in antiquity, it seems to have been called Anopaya. And on the other side, it's flanked by the sea in antiquity and marshes. 
So what you have to do is basically get soldiers around the Greek position somehow. They can't do it by sea because the Greek fleet is preventing the Persian fleet from entering the Gulf. So they have to look for an overland route. Those overland routes did exist. And what we're told is that with the help of some locals who lived in Malice, uh, just north of Thermopylae, the Persians discovered those routes or were informed about those routes late on the second day of Was fighting. this Greek spies or was this for the Persians? So it's important to restate here uh, an observation we've already made. Greece was not politically unified yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, moreover, there was a long history of interaction between Greek states and the Persian empire. Uh, Obviously, a whole bunch of Greek states in what is now Western Turkey were part of the Persian Empire. But then in the islands and in the northern part of the Aegean, there were states that were increasingly coming under Persian influence, partly because they were conquered, but also partly because in a lot of these cities, you had people who aspired to power, who were happy to collaborate with the Persians, right? to turn to the Persians for support. When it comes to the politics of 480, when the Greeks learned that there was this massive Persian force coming through, a number of Greek states, especially those in the north and in the center of Greece, um, those which were likely to bear the brunt of any attack, actually saw that it was in their interests to uh, make their peace with Xerxes. And the people living in Malice, the area just north of Thermopylae, were one of those groups that had submitted to Xerxes uh, before Xerxes actually forced them to it at sword point or at spear point, as the case may be. Right? So in 480, they are working already in some capacity with Xerxes, yeah. as were many other Greeks who were present in the Persian fleet. A lot was of there, yeah, the was there even some Greeks who fought with Persia? Yes, or? yes, of course. Yeah, there were a lot in the fleet because a bunch of the ships were um, crewed by Ionian Greeks and Aeolian Greeks from what is now Western Turkey. But there were also a number of Greeks who were uh, basically conscripted into the land army as the Persian army advanced west across the northern Aegean and south through Thessaly. So a lot of Thessalians, for example, were present as cavalry in Xerxes' army. So there are a lot of Greeks um, affiliated with the Persians and the Persian forces. And some of these locals native to the area around Thermopylae basically told Xerxes that they could lead Persians around through these flanking paths and get Persian forces behind the Greek position. So it seems that late on the second day of the battle, the Persian commanders decided that they would put this uh, proposed policy into practice. And what ended up happening is that the Persian officer Hydarnes, who was in command of the 10,000 so-called immortals in the Persian army, took a bunch of those immortals and embarked on a fairly complicated and challenging night march, which probably took close to 12 hours plus around the flank of the mountain um, and down the other side. This actually kind of really sounds really familiar to when Mehmed II invades Constantinople and he takes his fleet around the Golden Horn. So it's kind of really sounds similar to that aspect. It's, I mean, it's a very basic military doctrine, right? If you're yeah. tasked with trying to force your way through a fortified position where the ground is not favorable to you, the first thing you do is try to look for a way to get around yeah. that position, to turn it. So what we see here are the Persians doing precisely what it was that professional armies would need to do in this kind of situation. Now, the Greeks had anticipated this, right? They had posted a detachment of a thousand people, the Phokians, uh, on top of the mountain overlooking Thermopylae, yeah. who were stationed there. To okay. Oh, so they were aware of this. Kind of they were aware yes. of this. Yes. Um, we're told that Leonidas and his officers had been made aware of that path when they had arrived in the area, because there are locals fighting with them yeah. who said, okay, we understand that you want to defend the pass at Thermopylae. You need to know, however, <laughs> that there's another path around the other side of the mountain that the Persians could potentially use to get behind us if they discover it. So were the locals kind of playing both sides here? The Phokians? Is that what you The locals, the locals oh, of the yes. area, they, were they playing both sides? Some locals um, are definitely on the Persian side, as it were, right? They've submitted to Xerxes mm. uh, because the Persian army is right there. Other locals were probably of mixed opinions. And what Herodotus describes 
early on in the lead up to Thermopylae is a period of negotiations between the allies and states in central Greece who were unsure whether or not they would side with Xerxes. And part of the reason that some of the central Greeks, the people from Phocis and Locus in particular, eventually decided to support the other allies was because the allies promised that they would come to Thermopylae. Mm. So the, the locals who are fighting on the Greek side, the people from Phocis and Locus, had uh, essentially cast their lot in with the Greeks, although there are some who have argued <laughs> that the Phocians were not wholly committed and that the Phocians may have um, allowed the Persians, if you will, to pass them on the path. Mm. That's a disputed point. Um, the other way to look at this, I mean, what happens essentially is that the Persians make this crazy night march. They make contact with the Phocians around daybreak. The Phocians have a moment of panic where they realize they're about to be attacked by a large Persian force and abandon their original position for a more defensible position a little bit higher up. The Persians then ignore them essentially and continue on their way. Uh, so people have argued basically that the Phocians were not wholeheartedly committed <laughs> to the Greek cause yeah. and they could have fought but didn't. I mean, but you could also argue that the Phocians were just so surprised by the fact that a large Persian force showed up at daybreak that there was a moment of panic and chaos and indecision as they tried to get themselves organized. Remember, these are not professional soldiers by any stretch of the imagination yeah. and that they could have simply made a mistake that allowed the Persians to bypass them and then descend yeah. on their way to the rearward position at Thermopylae itself. So they, in the end, the, the, the Greeks didn't lose. So, and what is the consequence of this battle? Do the Persians invade it? Because it doesn't seem to me like they do, they just won and did they leave it at that or do they just invade uh, Greece? Well, a couple of complications here, a couple of complicated mm -hmm. questions, one involving the end of the battle and one involving the consequences, mm. right? Yeah. So the end of the battle, let's talk a little bit about that just because you've been curious yeah, about course. the role of the 300. Yeah. Um, so we're at this point on the third day, early in the third day, when the Persians have gotten forces in position to descend behind Thermopylae. What we're told in Herodotus is that the Greeks learned of this maneuver. Um, first, they get reports from deserters from the Persian side who come in during the night. These are probably Greeks who defected from the Persians to the allies. And they brought news that there was a turning force on the way. Uh, we're told that the omens were bad. There was a seer, Megistius, who apparently received some signs when he sacrificed that the Greeks were in trouble. And of course, there were scouts on the ridge near the Phocians who saw the Persian force advancing and came running down to tell the Greeks, you guys are in trouble. You're about to have a large force behind you. Right? At that point, Leonidas and his Greek allies had to make crucial decisions. Do we stay at Thermopylae or do we go? In the end, most of them decided to abandon the position. However, Leonidas with his 3000 Spartans stayed behind as did 700 or so soldiers from Thespiae, a small city in Boeotia, as did 400 people from Thebes, another city state in Boeotia. Mm. So there's a group, I mean, they had taken casualties, so they were not at full strength, but let's say 1200 hoplites, heavily armed soldiers stay along with the Spartan helots who are in attendance, maybe some other light infantry while the rest of the force yeah. withdraws. Um, why they stayed is a question that preoccupied Herodotus uh, and he has a lot to say about it. Uh, he focuses mostly on the glory Leonidas thought that he would win um, he focuses on a prophecy, or he mentions a prophecy, which basically said, you know, it had been prophesied that the Spartans would either lose a king in this war or Sparta would be destroyed, <laughs> mm. right? So he makes the suggestion that Leonidas thought that he ought to sacrifice himself if necessary. Yeah. Um, that might be a later- So he knew he would sure. die eventually. Maybe. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure that the people who stayed behind understood that this was very risky, right? Yeah. But I think a lot of historians would argue that they also understood that it was important for them to stay behind and fight a rearguard action to allow the larger group of this allied army to withdraw. If the whole army had just abandoned its position, they would have been vulnerable to pursuit. Since but I hope that there would be a, be a huge, huge part of history as well as their hope that it would be mentioned in history. 
Well, this is what this is what Herodotus says, right? That Leonidas hoped to establish, you know, uh, a reputation uh, for doing this, and you know that may well have been on their minds, as might some of the strategic and tactical uh, necessities of fighting a rearguard action. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so what ends up happening is you have this smaller group of about twelve hundred people plus helots and other attendants who decide to stay behind and delay the Persians as long as possible. Right. On the morning of the third day, uh, what happens is that the Persians from the West launch these wave attacks again. And this time we're told the Greeks, instead of sheltering behind that wall, advanced into the wider part of the pass and fought something more like a stand-up field battle against the Persian forces. According to Herodotus, this was a really intense period of fighting and a lot of people get killed, obviously. Uh, on the Persian side, the most famous casualties are two brothers of Xerxes, who apparently died you know, fighting while leading troops from the front. On the Greek side, the most famous casualty is Leonidas himself, who dies during the stage of the fight. Do we have any idea who killed him, or do, we have, do the sources of the state who kills him? Not in Herodotus, no. Uh, it, it's unclear who actually struck the fatal blow. That's what seems to me that the uh, Romans are good at doing. They are really good with naming those. Let's say Crassus get dies, he gets the name who killed Crassus and this name the sources on who right. killed him. But here are some things. Is it just that it's so long time ago? Or well, again, you know, Herodotus had the challenge of trying to navigate between a bunch of different and often conflicting mm. traditions. Uh, and he also had the challenge of uh, basically trying to reconstruct a story, which in this particular stage, uh, a story that did not have a whole lot of surviving witnesses, since most of this group of 1200 end up dead. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so there, he may just have had uh, difficulty saying with confidence who it was who had struck that fatal blow. Right. Anyway, Leonidas dies. Uh, there's a furious battle over his body as the Persians try to drag it away and the Greeks try to protect it. And then for whatever reason, there's a lull in the fighting. And at that point, the survivors of this group of 1200 decide to retreat. They withdraw past the wall and past their original position and take up a new position on a hill, uh, a steep hill, which they hoped would be defensible mm -hmm. enough to protect them when they were inevitably surrounded yeah. <laughs> right, by Persians coming from the West and the immortals coming from the East. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, what we have are the survivors of the 300 Spartans plus the Thespians. Uh, the Thebans, according to Herodotus, surrendered mm. at this point. So the final group was mostly Spartans and Thespians. And according to Herodotus, they were essentially killed to the last man as the Persians surrounded them and essentially cut them down with a volley after volley of arrow fire. Right? And with that, the battle was over and Xerxes and Enforcers had essentially turned and captured the position and the Greek fleet at Artemision, which had engaged in some naval battles with the Greek fleet stationed opposite, also withdrew uh, towards Athens. Now consequences, right? Yeah. Um, this was a defeat for the Greeks. It was a tactical and strategic victory for the Persians. Xerxes and the Persians mm -hmm. did what they needed to do. The Pers the but the, the Persians did not win the war, they just won the battle or is this- They win this battle, case? right. They, they, I mean, they lose the war, I guess, technically, mm. in the long run. Because they, um, it's, if I remember correctly, they don't, they don't invade Greece. That's the Romans who invade Greece in 88 BC, but the Persians did never invade Greece themselves. Well, in the wake of the Battle of Thermopylae, they actually do push southward, mm. um, further into Greece. Uh, they made it as far as Athens by September 480. Mm. And the Persian forces actually attacked, captured, and sacked Athens itself. Mm. The Athenians knew that they couldn't really defend Athenian territory against the Persian onslaught. So they had mostly evacuated as many people as they could uh, to nearby islands and to Troizen in the Northern Peloponnese. So the city was largely empty, although there was a diehard contingent of Athenians who thought that they could defend the Acropolis uh, incorrectly as it turned out because the Persians captured the Acropolis as well. So by 480 BCE, uh, Xerxes had accomplished one of his main goals, which was to take Athens and punish the Athenians. And I think in September, he was rightly confident that the campaign was going 
as he wanted it to, right? He defeated the Greeks at Thermopylae, including the Spartans. He'd killed the Spartan king and he captured and sacked Athens. Unfortunately for Xerxes, he then made a questionable decision to fight a naval battle against the Athenian fleet, which had stationed itself on the island of Salamis in a narrow channel between Salamis and the mainland of Athenian territory where the Persians would be unable to fully exploit their numerical advantage at sea. Um, historians will argue about whether or not Xerxes should have done this for a long time, right? There's a, a very, uh, I think, sensible school of thought which argues that if Xerxes had just held out for a little bit longer and not moved from Athens, the Greek fleet eventually would have broken up yeah. as allies argued with one another uh, and that he could have then pushed westward into the Peloponnese. But because he decided to initiate an attack, the Greeks held together. And because the Persians were again attacking in unfavorable circumstances, basically by sailing into this fairly constricted channel where they couldn't exploit their numbers, they were defeated. And that proved to be um, a pretty serious setback for the Persians because once they no longer had superiority at sea, it became much more difficult for them to keep their army supplied by sea, right? Ancient armies, especially big armies like the Persian army eat a lot. Yeah. And it's hard to keep them supplied. You can't the fish, there's not, there's, you can't fish to everyone. Right, exactly. Um, now the Persians were really good at managing problems like this. They had uh, complex logistical tactics that could keep armies supplied in the field. But in this particular invasion, a lot of that hinged on being able to move stuff by sea. And once that was no longer possible, the Persian army on land lost the ability to kind of move around wherever it wanted. So they had to fall back. Xerxes himself at this point went home. Uh, he had a big empire to manage after all. Yeah. And he left command of the war in the hands of his cousin Mardonius, who based himself for the winter of 480, 479 further north in Thessaly, which had gone over to the Persians and which was close to Persian supply depots in the North Aegean. This gave the Greeks a critical period of time in which they could kind of, you know, take a deep breath <laughs> mm -hmm. and try to recalibrate themselves uh, and, and reset. So if they hadn't won this naval victory at Salamis, um, things might have ended very differently. And the mm -hmm. Persians may have overwhelmed much more of Greece than they did. As it turned out, uh, what happened next is that in 479, in the spring and summer, Mardonius moved south again. He came as far south as Athens which he occupied a second time. But then when he learned that a major allied Greek force was advancing from the Peloponnese, he decided to fall back a little bit to the north into Boeotia, where he thought the ground would be better for his army. His army had a lot of cavalry in it. So he was looking for a place where there was some wide open ground where the so cavalry in the, could exploit so the it, So in the end, they never really invaded Greece completely. Never completely. I mean, again, you know, they invaded a big chunk of it. Mm. <laughs> it's only the Peloponnese that kind of emerged. But they didn't unscathed. keep it for very long. Right. They keep it for two seasons, or at least mm. the mainland for two seasons. Mm. Right. They're eventually defeated in battle at 479 at Plataea in Boeotia uh, by this large Greek army uh, in a battle that unfolds again over several days, a really intense battle that probably could have gone either way, but which is ultimately decided in favor of the Greeks. And with that, um, the, the Persian invasion of Greece is effectively over. Although there were several years of fighting after this as the Greek allies tried to push out remnant forces of the Persians from the mainland, from the Northern Aegean, from the islands, and then started to launch campaigns against the, uh, what is now Western Turkey and to drive Persian forces out of that region as well. Yeah. And uh, I think we basically covered the basic of the battle, I hope. And uh, before you go, do you have any social media and anything you wish to promote that uh, you wanted to plug in the podcast description? Well, it, uh, if people want, they can find my academic profile. I'm at the University of Rochester. So if you search for Cameron Hawkins in Rochester, it should bring up my webpage. And that includes, among other things, a list of my publications. Um, a lot of those publications are on Roman economic history. Uh, which is kind of my primary research area, but it will link you to the article that I wrote on the Spartan army a few years ago. Um, so that's one place you can start. 
Um, otherwise, you know, there are a lot of a lot of historians who are writing about issues of Greek warfare, who are worth looking up if people are interested in these things. I know I just the will. Yes, well, I, I think the person who is writing most frequently about this these days is a guy named uh, Roel Kaninendijk, who uh, is currently lecturing at Oxford University and just published a big book on Greek warfare. So his stuff is worth a look too for people who are interested in this kind of material. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure to have you on and I hope you enjoyed this episode. My name is Alan. You can find uh, us on Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you can find podcasts. And we are on Instagram as well, on the world that is dwell. And the next week, we will take a look at the Danish Empire. It will be a two-part empire episode with the rise and fall. We both have the writers of the, the height and fall of the Danish Empire, Kurt Willard Jensen and Mark Michael Branksbu. So stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Alan. This has been World That H12. And I'll see you next time.